Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Odd and Untold. This is episode 14. And this week, very cool episode. I'm excited about this one. Mike Famelant from In the Shadow of Big Red Eye is joining me today. He's a neighbor. He's uh, from Jersey. I'm in Staten Island. So, uh, Mike, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. It's awesome. Yes. And we are neighbors right down uh, the road. Actually, Anyways, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, man. So yeah, I, I we were kind of talking off the air, and I was saying how I've I've known about your show for a while now in the shadow of Big Red Eye, and seen, since seen some episodes a while back, and uh, I just watched your new episode tonight, and there was one I think last week you were in the Adirondacks, so I mean yeah. you know catching up on on your shows, but the West Virginia one was pretty cool, so that one just dropped today about probably like two hours ago I think right yeah not not too not too bad you're you're really on the ball which I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so how how did um so let's let's start at the beginning. I just want to know a little bit more about your how you got into this. Uh yeah. I, I love hearing people's experiences. I mean that that's basically what the podcast is about. I do want to talk more about your show, but I'd love to know just how you got into Bigfoot. I know you had an experience in 2011. So if you could just take us yeah. through that, I'd love to hear. Yeah, so uh we were we were up in North Florida. I was on a BFRO expedition and uh it was my first ever time camping, like ever ever time ever in the woods. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very indoor growing up and and that's kind of one of the reasons why I made the show is to is the mission my mission statement beyond the show is to get friends and families outside to entice them off the couch and get them into nature. So um I was always always that that uh opposite uh, inside growing up, uh, you know, video games, like I said. So this first Bigfoot trip, it was like awesome. And we get there and nothing happens. It was, <laughs> it, there was like 60 other people there that were in North Florida and nothing happens. And it was, it was really cool though. Uh, a lot of really great people, uh, met, met some really cool people and some really awesome hiking and stuff. But, um, it really, uh, it, it was a, a bummer because nothing happened. So it was the last night and uh, me and my buddy, we were living in Tampa mm. and uh, we couldn't see the night sky. Um, and uh, I'm accustomed to the night sky being from Northwest New Jersey. We could see it pretty good up here. So in North Florida, you could see the night sky. And I was like, oh man, there's a meteor shower tonight. We got to stay up and watch the meteor shower. This is just a given thing. So we're up watching this meteor shower. It's like three o'clock in the morning or something like that. And we hear a knock on a tree hmm. and I'm like, oh man, I instantly thought it's these people that put on the show, the, the, or the expedition that are knocking on trees. They're getting our, our money's worth out of it. So I was like, okay, that's, that's cool. And then um, I heard another knock on, we heard another knock on the tree in the complete opposite direction. And I'm like, oh man, these people are pretty good, you know? And um, then uh, like a fist sized rock about five minutes later, fist sized rock about a rock this size kind of get comes crashing through the trees and lands like 10 feet from us, five to 10 feet from us. Um, and at that point, um, I am petrified and I say, nope, this is how horror movies start. I'm getting <laughs> out of here. Uh, my buddy's like, if you want to go sleep in the sleep in the tent, you're more than welcome to. And by the time he could finish that sentence, I had all my tent, my sleeping bag in my arms and I was just running towards the car. Um, so it took him a little bit, but he convinced me to, he was like, Mike, this is, you know, this is what Bigfoot supposedly do. This could be a Bigfoot, you know, Bigfoot activity. Why don't you come out and experience this? This is why we're here. Right. <laughs> and um, I was finally kind of like convinced. All right, whatever. And over the course of the next like five minutes or 15 minutes or so, uh, f four more of these rocks, fist size, kind of land in the same general vicinity as the first one. Um, and I'm, I'm horrified. And my buddy <laughs> is like, I'm going to throw a rock back at it. And I said, I don't think that's a good idea, you know? And so he throws the rock back at it and, I don't know if Nolan Ryan's out in the woods or not, but a, a laptop sized boulder came crashing down through the trees wow. and landed 10 feet from us. So um, that, that right there was like the first beginning of like this, this has got to be something to this. It was outside of human range. There's no way a person could have done it or thrown that. So, um, you know, it's, it, it, it got me, really thinking this has to be there it's got to be something behind all these sightings and encounters and 
I started looking more into it and, you know, that was back in 2011. So 11 years later, here we are. Yeah. And that, and that's interesting, you know, as I'm listening to your story and, and I always try to kind of get into the brain of a skeptic and sort of say, well, okay, how can I debunk this? You know, it's, that's mm-hmm. always been my, my approach to the paranormal, to Bigfoot, anything is just, how do you, how do you debunk this? And, and as you're telling the story, you know, my, my mind's going and I'm saying, okay, well, you're there with 60 other people, BFRO, and I'll get into that. Cause I, I actually looked into going out with them once. Um, and you're saying, okay, you know, small rocks are kind of coming in and it could just be someone in the woods, you know, messing with sure. you or trying to, you know, ha- ha- have you get your money's worth as they Absolutely. say, you know, and yeah. the same thing with the tree knocks, you know, is it just these guys just trying to, you know, get you to pay more money for the next expedition, but you get a, a much bigger rock and you're saying, okay, you know, even a, a large, yeah. strong adult maybe can throw that a foot or two, you know, like, right. you're gonna, you're gonna like well, really struggle. And, and, you know. <laughs> and we did the scientific thing and we did like measurements and it was at least because of the geology and the terrain of the, of the, where we were, it was the closest it could have been was a hundred yards, whatever that subject was, the closest it could have been was a hundred yards just to get the trajectory coming through the trees. Like it had. Right. Right. So like I said, unless you got someone like Nolan Ryan out there, who's just, <laughs> just waiting around for, for, you know, a couple dumb people to come camp and to throw rocks at you. I don't know, but yeah, that, that um, uh, it's it. And like I said, it's, it's so outside of human range. So I don't know that was just really cool. And, and, like I said, it, it put me on this whole, whole train of, uh, as Bigfoot. Yeah. So, so why did you go on the exhibition to begin with? I mean, it, was, was, was it your friend that was more into it? Or <laughs> no, <were> you... <laughs> no. Uh, I was actually, uh, so, um, I was, uh, I moved down to Florida for, uh, my ex fiance and I was living down there and I was working at a beach resort and I was bored as anything one day. And I was, uh, I was watching finding Bigfoot on TV and it kind of piqued my interest a little bit. And they're like, oh, if you want to come out with us, go on their website. So I went on their website and I went through their whole, you know, their whole process. And, and I didn't tell my, didn't tell my fiance at the time. And, and then uh, I got approved and everything and paid all the money. And then I, I was like, honey, <laughs> guess what we're doing before our wedding? We're going to go look for Bigfoot. <laughs> and then we broke up before the expedition. So I don't know if oh, it was wow. related to that or not. I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, so then that I, I moved up to Tampa to uh, get a job in the ambulance. I, I'm an EMT. Right. And um, I got a job working for the city uh, on the ambulance. And I picked, I, I swear, this is how I did it. I picked my weirdest partner. I said, and it was, it was like, Jimmy, you, you're it. You want to come to North Florida, look for Bigfoot. And he's like, uh, I've always wanted to do that actually. So best friends to this day. So wow, awesome. that's how it happened. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'd actually looked into the, the BFRO expeditions and, you know, talked to someone on the phone about it and it, you know, it, it kind of turned me off cause I was really looking for something more intimate and, you know, like you said, you got 60 people out there and, right. um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's I, very, I'm amazed it's, that you, that you actually experienced something. It's very, it's very difficult to sneak up, uh, on something with 60 people in the woods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, but, and I'll, I'll tell you, I think the reason why we did experience something is because we actually camped, um, about 50 yards away from everybody else. See, we thought everybody that was there is going to be weird. Mm-hmm. because they're all looking for Bigfoot. <laughs> so we were like, we're going to camp a little bit further away from them. So that that led us about 50 yards deeper into the woods. And I think that's what directly led us to have the activity well, where nobody else did. Yeah, no, definitely. And that's, uh, you know, I've talked about it on the show before. And, I, you know, I think, you know, the, the best way to go Bigfoot hunting sometimes is just to kind of not go Bigfoot hunting. Yeah. You know, just just go camping and and yeah, like you'd think, like oh, stay with the BFRO guys. You know, they got all the equipment, they got the thermals, they got you know the experienced investigators. Uh, but here you guys go kind of off on your own, um, away from that crowd, and and you're just camping. And at that point, like you were saying, like nothing's happening. You're probably expecting nothing to happen, and then something happens. So that's right. um, you know, usually when you hear experiences, it's people who are not looking for Bigfoot. It's you know the people who go looking for Bigfoot don't usually find you know obviously don't find bigfoot (laughs) yeah well and here's the thing too is um kind of get into the community of bigfoot a little bit is is that um bigfoot researchers don't report their own sightings 
Mm -hmm. So, so like I've had a couple of really good vocalizations, but I've not reported them to the BFRO. So that doesn't get on that international database. I have uh, contra, you know, uh, oppositely, I have sightings uh, from Sussex County where I'm at. There's uh, 58 sightings in the county, mm -hmm. and it's the you know the database that I've compiled myself, um, and that's not on the BFRO database. You know what I mean? So so I, I wish there as a community, I wish there as Bigfoot researchers, we could all share our 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 sightings and our information more openly. I think that would help help the field greatly. But unfortunately, there's some uh, some reason why we don't. I don't know why. Yeah, definitely. And and a few shows back, I had my friend Josh on, and uh, he actually asked because he's he's interested in this stuff, but he's not really a researcher in the same way like you and I would be. And he asked the question, like, is there a, a main database of like Bigfoot sightings? And, you know, we were kind of talking about how there really isn't. And there's this like weird territoriality in, hmm. and this, this goes for like the paranormal community. This goes for the UFO community. Um, you know, people kind of have their information and they kind of want to keep it secreted to them. And, you know, th this is my hot spot and that's your hot spot. And I'm not telling anybody else about my hot spot or what I saw. Um, yeah. So it, it is a, a shame that there really isn't just, I mean, the BFRO is probably the biggest one, but there, sure. there's definitely going to be stuff on there. That's not list. You know, you're going to go there and there's going to be stuff that's not on there that people have experienced. Well, and, and, you know, I was a, I was a, for a very short period of time, I don't talk about it too often, but uh, I was a researcher with the BFRO mm -hmm. um, and I had access to the database, the, the, uh, the blue book, as they call it, I think the blue files or something, something like that, or the data, I don't forget what they call it, but um, uh, there was so many sightings that were either unreported or uninvestigated reported but uninvestigated so i mean we're talking hundreds if not thousands of reports in the country that have not been investigated yet wow. or that have been investigated but are too good to go on the website because of this territory thing oh because, really oh yeah absolutely yeah you think <laughs> cliff you think like in in matt moneymaker's area in 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 uh uh his original encounter do you think that's on exactly where it is? Listen, no, on that BFO no, not at all. <laughs> no way. He wants that to himself. Yeah. So it, it is weird that there's that territoriality. And uh, in a way, I do understand it. You almost don't want to like say, oh, this is where I was. And then you have a bunch of people just rushing to that location and it becomes sure. oversaturated, mm -hmm. which I, I do feel has happened in certain spots as it is. You know, I, I think they're just, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I think it can happen, but I don't think it's like a lot of people think it's like, like with my videos, like I just, like you said, I just released a Sutton West Virginia video. Now that video, we weren't there. That video was done a while ago and it's just being released now, but I don't expect my followers to rush to Sutton West Virginia. I mean, it would be super cool if they did, because I know there's like a Bigfoot museum there and mm. those guys would love it, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, I don't, I don't think, um, you know, say we had a really good class A sighting there. I, I, you know, I, I don't think people would necessarily rush there to try to see it themselves. I think it's more so of a, Oh, okay. We know it's in the area type of thing. Right. I, know, I could, right. I could be wrong at least in New Jersey, maybe because there's not a lot of Bigfoot researchers in New Jersey. That's my mindset. I don't know. Right. Yeah. And, and, I don't know what the reason is, you know, for the territoriality, I, it, it, but it is weird and it, it does cross all the communities. Cause like I said, I, I sort of in, initially started in more of like a ghost hunting group and we did paranormal stuff and same thing with other groups. Like they wouldn't tell you where they investigated. They wouldn't, yeah. you know, they, they would try to get in good with the owner of a certain place. So like, don't let any other groups in. Right. And then you'd have the TV shows trying to muscle the, their way <laughs> in. And um, it, it just, it, it it's funny, you know, but, but also frustrating just how little information is shared. And, and when good information is out there, the people keep it, you know, close to the, yeah. close to the vest and they don't want to share it. Well, I think, I think Bigfoot research and, and same thing with paranormal research and UFO research and everything. I think it's, I think it's uh, a big puzzle piece, a big jigsaw puzzle. And the more pieces that everybody can add to the puzzle, the easier we're going to see what that big picture actually is. And unfortunately with everybody being so secretive and territorial with their information, it's very difficult to get those puzzle pieces, especially those hard areas that we're really trying to find that information from, you know, those puzzle, the, the areas with all the same colors, you know, that right. really difficult area. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, if people would just share a little bit more of that section, it would be so much easier for all of us, and especially the people outside of the Bigfoot community to look in and be like, oh, wow, these people aren't that crazy. That's cool. Right. Because anybody who's doing some real analysis is just has real big gaps in the information because, sure. you know, there, there may be something out there that connects point A and point B, but if no one's sharing that information, that connection is never made. And yeah. that, that could be the clue that leads us to something. Uh, so it, it is really frustrating. Um, so, so yeah, you know, and I, I appreciate that you kind of say where you, where you're at and what you're doing and, and that's yeah, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, so, so I know you kind of started the show, you, you say in your introductions that, uh, you know, it's because of, all the, you know, the other, like sort of the TV shows that you wanted to show more of a, like a realistic Bigfoot hunting experience. Uh, right, right. And, and I wouldn't necessarily call it hunting. I'd say more researching, uh, cause we're not out to, I'm not out to, you know, shoot or injure any of these things. I just like to clarify right. that with, cause there are people that, that are, uh, um, do you want to injure and kill one of these things? So oh, exactly. I'm not one of those those people. So hunting kind of has that negative derogatory kind of annotation to it. Um, but anyways, um, yeah. So um, all the the shows on TV, uh, just like, especially when I first got into it, we used to research uh, the ways that we saw um, on TV. Uh, so we would do like Bigfoot howls, like like every two minutes, we'd be knocking on every tree possible um and we really wouldn't be doing a correct and thorough investigation of the area mm -hmm. so and and that's you know granted these shows i will say uh most of them not all of them but most of them are made just for the ratings and i get that you know totally understandable but i wanted to i have a kind of like a, a background in video editing so i wanted to make a show i was going to be like well uh, let's make a show that's not for the ratings. Let's make a show that's just about Bigfoot research. And, um, you know, I don't care if I don't have any likes or subscribers or anything. It's not really, you know, I'm not getting paid for it. It's just a hobby. Right, right. So let's do it. And uh, so far, it seems like the, uh, the uh, it's been pretty good. People seem to like the show. Yeah, for sure. And I, 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 that's what I like about your show. Um, it, it's just, it's a realistic look into what it's like you know, and uh, whenever people hear that I do this, you know, whether it's the ghost hunting or, or Bigfoot research out in the woods, uh, people always, oh, it sounds so exciting. I, I want to come with you one time. And I'm like, it's not what you see on, and they think it's no. what you see on TV. They think it's running yeah. through the woods and what was that? And uh, just all this excitement. And I'm like, you know, ghost hunting yeah. is sitting in an abandoned building for eight hours in the dark. You know, you got to turn the heat off in the winter. You got to turn the AC off in the summer. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. It's dusty. It's, it's not fun. And out of those eight hours, maybe you have two or three seconds of something interesting mm -hmm. happening and sure. more times than not, not even that. Um, and yeah, like you said, the, the, the shows on TV, they're for ratings. They got to get people to tune in every week and, and get that adrenaline going and they condense an entire night into, you know, 44 minutes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, a, a lot of people, a lot of the critics of my show are like, well, um, you, you bring uh, cameras and stuff into the woods and that's not how you that's not how you're going to find a Bigfoot. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. You know, just like you just said, <laughs> the, the best way to find a Bigfoot is to go to a field and sit with nothing, not even a cell phone for, you know, the entire night in a ghillie suit and listen. Right. That's that's how you're going to find Bigfoot. And you're going to get vocal, you're going to get audio evidence. And that's how, that's how, aside from DNA evidence, audio evidence is, is how we're going to find Bigfoot for sure. A hundred percent. It's not going to be a video. It's not going to be, you know, a, a, a track. We've had really awesome track ways, tracks and stuff like that. But besides the DNA, like I said, it's going to be audio. Um, so if you can, I mean, but that really makes like a really piss poor show. You just sit in the dark for eight hours. So it it does, you know, and, and <laughs> it's real, it's, you know, it's realistic, but you know, people, I, I feel like most people are going to not have that attention span. They, they want something interesting to happen. Yeah. And, and it's funny, you know, reading the forums online where people defend this stuff and uh, that's what they want. You know, they want a horror movie. They want yeah. entertainment. They don't want reality. They don't want a documentary. They don't want to see what it's really like. They want excitement. They want people running through the woods, scared, chasing yeah. some unseen thing 
And when they don't get that, they're, they're going to tune out. And, you know, yeah. your, your show is cool because it's just very chill. It's just very like, you know, this is what we did. And if you didn't find anything, you didn't find anything. And that's but that's reality. You know, you're not going to find something every week. There's not always going to be the the howl or the tree knock or, or a footprint. Most times you go out there, you're going to find nothing because that's reality. And I think duly important, it's when we do find something, it's the real like it's the real reaction. It's like you're not seeing something made up. It's like this is holy crap, you know. Even if it wasn't Bigfoot related, and I know recently I've gotten a lot of uh, coyote calls. The coyotes up in New Jersey have been going crazy lately. Oh, wow. So every time that I hear, you know, I'll do a call and I get a coyote back. I always, I always, you know, get that really cool because you know, like you're talking to an animal, basically. Right. <laughs> um, and it's so cool, and you see that reaction, and it's the, you know, it's the truth, you know, it's the raw emotion there too. And, you know, even when we, when we find some Bigfoot stuff, it's the real thing. Um, it's not, it's not scripted. It's not, um, it's not, uh, anything like that. You know, it's me and my cameraman sometimes, most of the time it's just me. Yeah. But, um, another important aspect of the show too, is, is that I do all the editing for it. So I, for everything from planning the expeditions to, marketing the show and funding the show and everything like that so so from pre post pre-production to post-production everything is done solely by me and it's a it's a lot of work and it's a lot of time and a lot of effort but um it's totally worth it um but i think that's also important for people to know too because it's not it's not like i don't i don't put music over evidence you know what i mean like some oh, shows yeah. will uh, all, all, all the shows do <laughs> you know like i hate like that's the thing that gets me it's like you'll never that's never gonna happen in my show <laughs> and, and again that's for the dramatic effect and they're saying oh listen to this howl and you're listening to this howl and there's just a spooky orchestra yeah. <laughs> in the background and you're like well i can't hear the spooky howl that you're telling me to listen to um and it's just so frustrating and but again, that's what the masses want for the most part. And it's, it's, it's sad and frustrating, but you know, I like shows like yours. I like where it's just sort of showing, you know, a day in the life of, of a Bigfoot researcher, just going out there and, and, you know, you show yourself cooking, you show yourself just setting yeah. up your camp, you show it's raining right now. I can't do anything. Yeah. Um, it's it rains just, a lot. We get a lot of rain. Yeah. <laughs> <seems>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and I'll tell you too, uh, the reason why I've, I've kept the show going, we're filming season seven now and, you know, we're releasing season six. So it's, and, and it's, it's been, we've been doing it since 2016. Um, but uh, I think back in, in season two or something like that, I got a, 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 an email or something from somebody. It was a YouTube message or something. And uh, it was from an elderly gentleman. He said he's been Bigfoot researching his whole life and he has a new acute kind of dis disease and he can't, you know, walk really anymore. And uh, he wanted to thank me because he lives vicariously through my show. <laughs> and that was like the coolest thing. And I'm like, that, that kind of made the decision for me. Like, okay, I'm going to keep doing this, <laughs> you know? So if people can gain that from, from my show, then that's more than I could have ever imagined uh, the show could do for anybody. Yeah. And, and stuff like that's awesome, you know, just to get feedback uh, like that and to, and to hear that. And, and, and that's kind of what I take from, from your show, you know, like, cause I'm, I'm on Staten Island. I'm in the city, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. probably the worst place to be a, a Bigfoot enthusiast is in New York city. <laughs> um, I try to get camping like four times a year, maybe five up in the Adirondacks, yeah. but it, it's, it's, nice. it's tough, you know, cause it's, it's a long drive. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work and just, you know, you have responsibilities at home between work and family um, but I love watching your videos. I love watching just even just regular camping videos, just because it, it's that vicarious experience and mm -hmm. to just, you know, it brings back memories of my own trips and, and just, again, I, I mean, I just watched a video of yours where you, you drove down to Florida and you didn't sleep for like 36 hours. <laughs> <laughs> that was horrible. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And you were that just a rough one. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, if I drive for about three hours, my eyes are just like, Nope, like <laughs> we're done. You know, they just, they dry out and they hurt. And I'm like, I, three hours is like my max. And I'm like, man, 36 hours. I, yeah. I I'm still, I'm that. still waiting to hear back on the sponsorship from Red Bull from that episode. Still heard that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You didn't mention them a few times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But that, you know, that like stuff like that is awesome because it's it's something I can't really do myself. You know, I can't just put myself in a car and drive down to Florida as much as I would love to. 
Um, but I remember, yeah. you know, you just put up the GPS and you're like, yeah, it's like a 17 and a half hour trip. And then little thing at the bottom of the screen, it's like, you know, 20 hours without sleep, 24 hours <laughs> yeah. without sleep, 30 hours without sleep. And at one point you're just like, you guys do the math. You know, I've been up since 10 a.m. yesterday and it's 2 p.m. now. And yeah, I think it was like 37 hours at that point, yeah. I, I, if I, I did know. the math right. But um, that's just like really cool stuff to just see you going just even just going to these places you know and and going down yeah. to the everglades and, and west virginia that that's just so cool it's the experience and that's yeah. that's what i hope everybody gleans from and gains from from the show it's not about big footing it's about and and like i kind of touched on before it's about getting outside and it's not you know it, it if you don't it, bigfoot is 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 vi is not for everybody Shockingly enough, uh, <laughs> some people aren't into searching for an eight foot tall cryptid. Um, but uh, my my whole thing is if you're not into big footing, there's a ton of other things that you could do. Like you could go hiking. I think um, I mentioned to you, we actually had to move this podcast up an hour because I'm going hiking to see the 9-11 Memorial Lights tonight. Right, right. Be hopefully not rained out, but I right. think it is. Um but um, hiking, uh, I got into fishing, uh, survival stuff like, you know, um, can can drink like lake water and stuff. I could boil like, you know, like stuff like that I would never thought I'd be doing if it wasn't for Bigfooting. So so uh, I would challenge anybody to just try to find something that they enjoy doing outside and and make it a make it a hobby and turn it into a passion like I did Bigfooting. Yeah, I, I definitely wanted to touch on that, too, because that's also in your intro about how you just want to kind of show people what's out there. And, and I think, you know, a lot of us have just sort of gotten so comfy being inside and with our devices and, you know, Wi-Fi. And it's it's a lot of people just don't go out there. And, and yeah, like you said, regardless of what you're looking for out there, uh, you know, because I've been on a lot of camping trips and and my focus is never Bigfoot when I go out, right. you know, I'm camping and it, of course yeah. it's on my mind. And of course you're sitting around the campfire <laughs> and you're going to listen to stuff. And if you're down by the water, you're kind of looking in the mud. <laughs> so, you know, what, what prints are down there, but it's, it's always just to get out there and disconnect. You know, we always kind of go like yeah. deep backwards camping, no cell phone service. And it's just to not be yeah. on Facebook for three days, to not be on Twitter mm -hmm. for three days, to not be able to check work emails. You know, it's just, just to watch the sunrise, to watch the sunset, to just hear the loons, uh, yeah. It's so like for me anyway, it's just such a like a recharge just to like reset my batteries and just see that like nature is so gorgeous and we just never see it for the yeah. most part, just working our nine to fives. Uh, and and I'll tell you a lot of a lot of a lot of people ask me like one of the main questions I get is how do you pick an area to go look for Bigfoot? And and, you know, I I get a chuckle when I tell people it's not, you know, I don't look for like recent sightings or anything like that. I look for, I go on, because I have Verizon, I have mm -hmm. Verizon cell phone, so I go on Verizon's coverage map, and I look to where kind of I really want to go, or where a vague area of where I want to go, and I see where it doesn't have service, and I pick the closest state park, and that's where we go. Nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, uh, the, the less service, the better for me, and it's uh, it's exactly the same reason, it's because you get to disconnect from uh, from nature, or from, from, you get to connect to nature and disconnect from everybody else. Right. Um, it's a shame I haven't been able to do that in a long time because of filming my show. I don't, I can't tell you the last time that I've been in the woods, um, not big footing, <laughs> you know, as you said, you don't normally go big footing. I have not been not big footing in quite some time. Um, so it'd be nice. I think, uh, I think it's in the cards this year just to get out and do a non big foot kind of vacation area, do something like that. Yeah, for sure. And that's probably when you'll encounter something. That's exactly and, and you, when you won't have yeah, your camera. Yeah, and... camera. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I'll come out to like a, a state park on Long Island or something where I don't have any chance of seeing a Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah. Um, so have you, have you? because again, you have a, an extensive, extensive catalog. Like you said, you've been doing this since 2016. Uh, have you ever experienced, I know you, you mentioned you had some vocalizations. Have you had any other experiences? Anything that you, you kind of felt was like, this might be actually a Bigfoot? Yeah, we were um, up in uh, up in the Adirondacks, like you were just saying, up in uh, Lake George in the White Hall in White Hall, New York. Mm -hmm. um, we go up there. We try to go up there every year. We're actually going to be up there um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, there's a big uh, Bigfoot uh, festival up there. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll be up there for that. Um, but we're up there, and we we like to go to this one area, and we've we've always gotten some. It's always like it's creepy. 
so we know it's like kind of a cool area so we always go back there mm -hmm. and um uh we were there and we split up into teams and it's all it's on my youtube channel anybody could take a look at it but we were surrounded by bigfoot for sure like within 20 yards there was like multiple i'd say like three bigfoot surrounding my team and uh they were you could hear them like uh like the the footfalls and the, the stomping you could hear uh rocks getting thrown and hitting trees right next to the team wow um and it was it was a pretty legitimate close encounter it went on for like six minutes um and then everything stopped when he got the thermal into him <laughs> so but we went back there the next day and uh there were tree breaks across the path that weren't there the day before and we're talking legit trees i mean we're not you know like like bigger than you know a person could do and they're fresh right. live trees so it's uh, outside of human human range to do that but uh that was probably the closest that i've ever been to a bigfoot i think wow that's crazy uh yeah you said there was like three of them i think there had to be at least three because they, there was three different directions that, that the the things were coming from wow yeah. So how, how how much credence do you kind of put into like your gut feeling? Because you're, you just mentioned like it had like a a creepy feeling, um, oh, and and I always yeah. try to pay attention to stuff like that. Yeah, uh, another video on my YouTube channel actually is um, I was going uh, so okay, so I'm okay hiking at night during the day by myself with people. I'm very comfortable, especially on this one trail that I've been on a million times. Right. I could hike this trail blindfolded. It's in a squatchy area. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's close to my house, but um, it's this really cool trail. So I was hiking it one night. I got dropped off, and uh, I was going to hike to the other side of it, like three miles. And I got a mile into it, and I hit a brick wall. And it's something stopped me, and I couldn't go. I just I I physically I could walk further, but I could not walk any further. And I was looking around. And I saw a tree break, which is something that Bigfoot are supposedly can do um, that, that I didn't think was there like a couple of weeks prior because I walked the trail all the time mm -hmm. uh, and I've never noticed it. Um, but it was so the feeling was so intense. I actually had to call my ride back and I hiked back out the other way because I couldn't finish the hike. Wow. Yeah. And I don't know what it was. I, I've never experienced it again. Some people they would they would chalk that up to infrasound. So what they say that Bigfoot could do is, is right. kind of like this, this low guttural growling sound that uh, humans, as us as humans, we can't hear, um, but other animals, other large animals, do are capable of it. So um, I don't know if that was it or not, but I would it whatever whatever if, if it was infrasound and Bigfoot didn't want me in the area, it totally worked. <laughs> yeah that's that's wild and it, similar thing happened to me once um but like i said i always try to you know a lot of people would scoff at it and you know you're just scaring yourself but uh there, there was a place we went to and it was probably one of the safest places we ever camped up in the adirondacks you know it was car camping to pull right up to the site you got our car right mm -hmm. there you know we had we had shotguns with us and just the entire time i just felt like really uneasy like i just didn't mm -hmm. want to you know and i love being up there i love i mean that's like my my happy place is going to the adirondacks and camping and just yeah. you know and people don't get it because it's like there's no bathrooms and you're sleeping on the ground and there's bugs and i'm like that's my heaven now yeah. and this one place just the entire night i could not get comfortable i just mm. um it was really weird and again i i you know i'm not saying it was bigfoot uh you know maybe there was a bear in the area maybe there was a mountain lion or something uh who knows you know but I, I always try to put credence into that. And I was talking to somebody a few months ago who had an, a, a similar encounter with his, his girlfriend in Colorado with a, a grizzly bear. And uh, he kind of felt it before they saw or heard anything. You know, it was just they yeah. kind of wandered into an area. And, and all of a sudden, he said it just his mood changed. And his he was just like he went into like fight or flight mode. And he was like, mm -hmm. I got to get out of here. And he turned to his girlfriend and said, if anything happens, you got to run, I'll take care of it. And she was like, what are you even talking about? You know, but he had wow. felt, yeah. and then, yeah, later on, they'd seen a, a grizzly bear, but he said it was oh, like 10, wild. 15 minutes before they saw any, any sign of a grizzly. Hmm. Um, so it, it's always interesting to me when people have those like gut instinct feelings of like, 
yeah this is not a cool area i gotta go and and yeah like yours to just freeze you you know for me i just kind of felt like a little uneasy but for you to kind of like hit that wall and say i'm heading out of here yeah that's really that's really fascinating to me and like i said you know i think the, the the thing that made me the most nervous was not not the fact that it could have been a bigfoot or it could have been even somebody out there the fact that i have been so for i'm so familiar with this trail and that happened that's what's freaked me out the most was like okay that something's really got to be messed up here and i'm not trying to figure out what it is right now <laughs> yeah it's not even just like a new place that you went to that's just kind of spooky and you're like, like yeah, i, I could, yeah. could chalk it up if it was somewhere brand new at night that i've never been you know okay yeah that could be a little creepy i get that but this like i said blindfolded i could do this trail yeah, it's like being spooked in your own backyard. Like it yeah. shouldn't it shouldn't make shouldn't sense. Happen. Shouldn't yeah. happen. <laughs> right. Uh right. so where's your favorite place to research? I know you, mm. you've done a lot of Jersey stuff, a lot of Florida stuff. Yeah. Um well I, I, I do like um going down to the Pine Barrens because mm. it's beautiful down there, the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. Um I really like Florida. I, I'd go down there every every year. I used to live down there, so it's kind of like my second well, is my second home down there. Yeah, yeah. Um uh, research wise i like going up to whitehall because that that area the general uh, whitehall uh, area seems to be really good when it comes to just evidence collection there's a lot of cool stuff they're very vocal up that way hmm. um uh i pennsylvania's got some really cool areas um i don't know i think like for me though it's not about like necessarily finding a bigfoot I think uh, for me, it's mostly like about the area and the people and and the sites and stuff. I'm I'm a real big like I like seeing like beautiful sites. So I know like Kentucky, like when I went to the Red River Gorge, like mm-hmm. that was gorgeous. Like that that's something phenomenal up in the Adirondacks and the High Peaks. I mean, come on, <laughs> you, you know you know what I mean? Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's places like that that aren't necessarily Bigfooty. But um, I mean, the Adirondacks certainly is, but um, uh, and so is Red River Gorge and every everything like that. But um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the most Bigfoot area to be my favorite. But uh, I do like the Smoky Mountains as well. They're just like the Adirondacks, and they're breathtaking beauty. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's nice. And yeah, you know, you mentioned something earlier about how you find sites, and like you don't necessarily look for like where was the most recent sighting or where were the most uh, populous sightings. Uh, I, I kind of, I've always personally felt that's kind of a wild goose chase, you know, because someone saw mm-hmm. something there a year ago. Why would this thing still be there necessarily? Like, I understand yeah. the thought process behind it, but at the same time, uh, these things are so elusive. They're so rarely seen as it is. So I understand, I understand if there's a lot of activity, you know, you're talking about Whitehall and, you know, mm-hmm. there's the famous sighting from up there and, uh, if there's a, sort of this recurring activity, I get that, but to sort of, you know, unless you're kind of following up and in investigating a specific sighting, but if you're, if you're yeah, out there exactly. looking for something, yeah. I think it's kind of, for me personally, I think if a Bigfoot encountered somebody at XYZ spot, that Bigfoot's probably going to avoid that spot for a while. Cause now it's like, crap, there's people here. I'm not going to go back there for a while. Or if I, I, I do, I'm going to be much more hmm. cautious. I, I would tend not to agree with that. Uh, so I think um, Bigfoot, I believe, and this is just my personal thought process, and, and, and I'll tell you why in a second, is uh, I think Bigfoot are nomadic, mm-hmm. which would mean uh, by process of elimination, they would go back to the same spot more than once. Um, now, with that being said, uh, a lot of people think that Bigfoot are migratory. And they go south during the winter and north, you know, and north during right, the summer. Right. I don't think that's that's feasible because there's no land mammal in the United States that does that or in North America that does that. So it wouldn't make sense for a, for an a animal such as Bigfoot to migrate such as that. Um, so let's take New Jersey because New Jersey is where I do all my research, right? Mm-hmm. So Bigfoot sightings in New Jersey increase by 80 percent every third year no matter where in the state you are so if you're so take for example sussex county in the north northernmost part of the the state where i'm at the sightings this year increased by 80 percent there was 15 sightings so far this year compared to the three that we normally have three four sightings that we normally have so what does that tell you 
that they're coming back. They're, they're, they're recovering three years. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're passing through every three years. So what, ha- what happens every three years? So, so let's look at that from kind of like a little broader, broader thing. So um, nomadic means that they follow food. So what do you think that the food that they eat is? I think that they eat very similar uh, eating patterns to bears. I think that's a very large animal. And if you look at sighting populations and Bigfoot, or if you look at sighting uh, maps of Bigfoot and uh, populations of black bear, they're almost the exact same, Right, which is kind of cool. So I think they, w- they would eat very similar things. That would just make sense. Um, so that means like 80% berries and grasses and stuff like that and shrubs and stuff. So what's cool and kind of what, what uh, icing on the cake to the theory is if you take a berry bush and you kind of strip it 100%, right? Mm-hmm. It takes three years for it to grow back berries. Oh, interesting. So I think that kind of puts credence on the three-year cycle theory. And if, if uh, you follow the patterns around the state, I can tell you in a year and a half from now, you're going to be down in the Pine Barrens. If you want to go camping down the Pine Barrens, we're going to have a <laughs> percent chance higher uh, seeing them than if you were any other place in the state. So that's interesting. That, that That's a good bit of data right there uh, yeah it puts some numbers behind the uh yeah behind the behind the stories yeah definitely and that and that's kind of the, the stuff we were talking about earlier that if we had this data that's more you know and what i was saying earlier was almost like if you have one sighting here then to to kind of focus on that necessarily uh i don't necessarily agree with that you know i i understand the reasoning yeah but for me, it's almost like we'll ex, you know expand because if it yeah. was there, then look at be, where else it could where be. else could could it be? But yeah, if, right. if you are seeing these patterns, if you're seeing, mm-hmm. and that's an interesting point you bring up, and and that's good research and legwork on your part. You know that that's awesome that you're noticing this, and I didn't know that about the berries. That's really interesting. So yeah, if they're mm-hmm. following these prey populations, whether it's deer or fish or whatever it is, and and you can kind of see these patterns then it's more interesting to sort of say, okay, well, yeah, maybe we should camp this area because th- it's now the third yeah. year again. You know, they and, and I would challenge anybody in their area to try to find similar patterns like that. It's a great idea to start at the um, at the berries and, and the three year cycle, but it could be something completely different. That's just that's New Jersey and what I've found. Right. Uh, I have all the sightings in Sussex County uh, on a database that anybody could look at. And uh, I, I would, you know, say to anybody, go and look, try to find patterns in that, find, you mm-hmm. know, prove, prove my theory wrong. I would love to be proved wrong. I think that's cool. Um, but uh, that could happen anywhere in, in the country, you know, um, and Bigfoot's, they don't necessarily, depending on the location, they don't necessarily need to be nomadic. They could stay where they are year round if they have enough food source. Right. So, so that's totally something that you could think about too, is, is, um, you know, when you're looking for these areas to look at, look for Bigfoot sightings, you know, um, granted you also need, uh, to have a Bigfoot sighting, you need two things. You need a Bigfoot and a person. Right. (laughs) And, um, I know granted, most of the sightings take place in the, in the wilderness and, and whatnot. Um, I know for me, and you kind of mentioned it before is what you go, I go like back country camping. I don't go in a campground with other people. I think that defeats the purpose of a camping and B looking for Bigfoot. Um, so I go where there's no toilets and there's no <laughs> facilities and there's, you know, you literally, there's, there's maybe, maybe a picnic table if you're lucky. Right. Um, and we have to, unfortunately, we have to go to drive-in locations because of the show, uh, mm-hmm. just to keep everything charged and stuff like that. Oh, of course. But um, we try to find the most desolate one to, to get to and, and, and pick it that way. Cool. Cool. And, and I like your distinction between nomadic versus migratory. I, cause yeah. I think a lot of people talk about them being migratory and, and I tend to agree with you on that one, that nomadic is a, is a better, it suits it better. It it's, suits it better. I think, I think Bigfoots are ancient humans and that's what we did as ancient humans. We were hunter gatherers and we kind of moved around where the food was. Right. So uh, it would just make sense um, that it would follow that pattern. Right. And I'm sure you're aware of this. We talked about this on the show before, but there's certain characteristics to certain Bigfoot in certain geographic areas. So uh, a Bigfoot in the Pacific Northwest is going to be built 
sure much differently than like a skunk ape in florida which is you know smaller and slimmer and and you know quicker moving versus something up in the pacific northwest or versus something up up here you know up, up in the northeast i love that you brought that up um it's actually one of my favorite things to discuss is a skunk ape in florida because you know i love doing research in florida and everybody right, right. says um oh you're looking for like a cousin of the bigfoot uh, it's a, you know, the skunk ape because he's smaller and he's, you know, he smells funny and whatever. <laughs> and it's not, it's, it's it, contrary to popular belief. I think they're the same species. I think they're just a smaller version of a Bigfoot. Um, right. And that could be explained easily by Bergman's rule, which is the theory that animals in warmer climates don't have to eat as much in the summer to sustain themselves through winter because yeah. they could just eat all year long. Right. Where animals in colder climates have to eat and grow as much as they can during the summer so that they can sustain throughout the winter. So it would make sense if you look at like deer, deer population, or even bear population in New Jersey up here, you have a 300 pound black bear and we wouldn't bat an eye at it where you have a 300 pound black bear in Florida. And it's like, you got to call <laughs> the presses because you know, there's That's something a monster going down on there. Here. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's the same exact thing with Bigfoot. I think it's very easily explained that way. Yeah. And, and that's always been interesting to me, too, is that when people report these things, you know, because, again, skeptics are going to say, oh, it's in the it's in the popular culture. It's in the zeitgeist. You know, so someone down in Arkansas seeing a Bigfoot, it's just because they've seen it on TV. But people in Arkansas, people in Florida, people down south don't report the Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot. They don't report the mm -hmm. Harry and the Hendersons Bigfoot. They're reporting something very different. It's it's a hairy humanoid, but it's skinnier. It's yeah. uh, more agile um a little shorter like you said not as bulky they don't need to bulk up for the winter it's it's a warmer climate it's a different terrain like they don't need yeah. the big muscular legs to climb up mountains it's not you know it's it's all flatlands and swamps and so they're built a little differently and that again to me doesn't prove their existence but it's it's just one more sort of little piece of the puzzle where it says okay these people are not reporting seeing patty you know they're mm -hmm. they're seeing something but they're saying no this thing was orange in color and it was it looked more like a like like an orangutan or a chimpanzee it was very skinny and lithe and yeah uh, that to me is just a fascinating little piece of evidence that often gets overlooked um but i'm, I'm can glad we, can we go back to uh new jersey real quick back yeah absolutely jersey? yeah so so there's a three-year cycle, right? Mm -hmm. And I, we'll get into it just a little bit more because I think it's it's just that interesting is because of sightings that people report, I can tell, so there's uh, nine individuals. Now this is gonna sound crazy, but there's nine individual Bigfoot in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. There's two, two family groups. One is a family group of five and the other is a family group of four. Uh, the, the family group of five comes before like a month before the other, the second family group and has like black hair where the second family group comes about a month later. That's who's moving through Sussex County right now. And they have reddish color hair. Hmm. So isn't that neat? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you could, you could tell just because, cause I'm getting reports of black Bigfoot down the Delaware water gap national recreation area down in Warren County right now. And about a month, ago they were up here in in high point area now that now the other group is up this way that's interesting and and these are reports that you're getting from people in, yeah. in the area and yeah. and, and seeing that's interesting because these are people who don't know each other they're not you know so why would one group all you know of witnesses all report this reddish sort of bigfoot while the other ones are reporting a black haired bigfoot uh mm -hmm. So little, little things they, like that get overlooked. And yeah, I, I was when, I, when they report seeing two, two younger looking ones with each other, it's like, Oh, okay. That's the second group of individuals, you know, wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And even that in itself is, is odd. Cause most people, you know, most Bigfoot sightings, it's an individual. They're seeing yeah. a Bigfoot, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's usually an adult, you know, they're usually saying, Oh, it's seven, eight foot tall. Very few people, you know, they're out there, but it's, it's, not the no. norm to sort of say I've seen a juvenile or a child Bigfoot or, you know, smaller and, ones. You know, it's, it's, um, with New Jersey, New Jersey's weird because we're like number five in this, in the, on the list for Bigfoot sightings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on, and that's out of like everywhere, you know, 50 states. That's New Jersey. That's pretty high. Yeah. And New Jersey's the most densely populated state. So it's like, like I said before, you, we do have so many sightings, but we also have so many people. 
So it's you need the two things to have that sighting, like I said before. So you do need to have like if you look at Montana, Alaska, Canada, virtually no sightings out there, but there's not a lot of people. Exactly. You know, I think if you had a lot of population in Canada, you'd have a whole of a lot more sightings. Yeah, definitely. For sure. But uh, and then a yeah, perfect example down down to is in the Pine Barrens where you have it's I think it's a uh, point uh, one person per square mile or something like that and it's uh, uh, a million square acres or some some ridiculous number and it's like man people have sightings down there too so I don't know could be could be anything yeah I've I've only been to the Pine Barrens once and it, it's it's an interesting area um, it's cool it, yeah it's very cool and it's 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 a lot of people don't think of the East Coast as, you know, Bigfoot country mm-hmm. because they, you know, the New York City and New Jersey and uh, they think of just big cities, Boston, and, and they don't realize that these states, you know, the city part of the state is just such a an infinitesimal part of the state where the Adirondacks are huge, the Pine Barrens yeah. are huge. Uh, there's whole swaths of Massachusetts that are huge and, and just sure. wooded and um yeah the pine you know, barrens is actually the largest uh tract of land on the eastern seaboard between maine and florida people wow. don't realize that yeah wow. it's one you know it's 1.1 million acres and you know no wonder why there's a, a the the theory or the lure of the new jersey devil down there because it's definitely creepy enough for for something like that i was just going to ask you about the jersey devil what are your thoughts yeah. on that <laughs> well i think you know i think uh and I tread lightly where I say this uh, because uh, I actually got a death threat about it one time. But for me, if it walks like a goose and talks like a goose, it's probably a goose, right? So I think the Jersey Devil is, uh, let's look at the description of it. It's six to seven foot tall, has glowing red eyes, and screams bloody murder at night. I think that sounds like a Bigfoot. And I could be wrong, (laughs) you know, but uh, I think the, the, the lure and the fable behind this, the the Jersey Devil is really cool. The thirteenth child of Mother Leeds, and mm-hmm. it killed the mother and grew bat wings and flew up through the through the thing. Um, fun fact for you: in nineteen oh nine, the Philadelphia actually offered a ten thousand dollar reward for the Jersey Devil for ca- oh excuse me capture of a Jersey Devil. Right, so somebody. I guess the laws were a little lax back then, but they they got a kangaroo. And they glued like wings to it mm-hmm. and they tried to turn it in, but then the zoo is just like, wait a minute, we know what a kangaroo is. <laughs> it's just a kangaroo. Right. So if, if you ever want to go down there, you and me, the offer is still valid. It's still, it's still, yeah, we should, we, should, we should go find it. <laughs> All right. You tell me when. Give me a date and a yeah. time and I'll be there. <laughs> sure, man. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm like you. I, I love the lore behind it. It's just, it's, it's such a, like a creepy anomalous story like it's just it's, yeah. it's so creepy especially like from the like the time period it's like you know just that time and it's like colonial times and it just it just feels like darker and and and, and just in the pine barrens Napole- like you're, you're, napoleon's brother had a sighting of the uh jersey devil oh really go figure mm-hmm. wow yeah but but i'm like you I, I i and i actually did a blog post on this a few years back about is the Jersey devil just Bigfoot, you know, and it got kind of conflated with this story, which I don't know where the story came from was the story there to explain the red eyes and the screams coming Mm. from the woods that people didn't see. And they just kind of made up this horse headed creature with bat wings, uh, you know, and it was that just sort of a fable to sort of explain or a myth to explain the unexplainable in the woods because they weren't seeing Bigfoot, but they were maybe hearing it or seeing the red eyes. And, oh, that's the Jersey devil. And that's where it came from. And, and it's something well, and far I, less fantastical. <laughs> I know I'm going to be getting, you know, I'll, I'll get some, some, some flashback from this too. But if you look up what a uh, Sandhill crane looks like and look mm-hmm. up what they sound like, um, I think that's a very, very plausible culprit for the Jersey Devil, especially in that time frame where they didn't have computers, they didn't know what anything was, and that bird is totally not supposed to be up in this area. Exactly. So I think one of them totally could have flew up this way, kind of lost a little bit, and and was up there for a year or two and just go and, and making everybody go crazy. I don't know. That's And again, I'm going to get some, some flack for that, but that's, that's all right. Yeah, well, you got to speak the truth, you know, and it's, it's, I, I think, you know, Occam's razor always has to come into account, you know, it's got to be the most plausible, you know, the most rational explanation has got to be the the best one usually. And and it's not to say that it absolutely is this, but 
mythical kangaroo creature with bat wings or sandhill <laughs> crane that got a little lost on its migratory route and you got to say it's probably a sandhill crane and and yeah like you said back then someone seeing a fleeting glimpse of this huge bird with red markings and yeah. there's no wikipedia there's no google image search where they can go and say hey what what did i see like, let me go check this out yeah. um they're just saying i saw the jersey devil and i i really because and again like you i don't think there's really been too many legit or uh <laughs> sightings of the jersey devil recently that you can put too much stock into you know well, and, and it, no and the you know there, there's never been like a, a hoof print found of the jersey devil i know the thing flies but it's got to land somewhere right and the pine right. barrens are all sand so right. it's like there's gotta i mean i don't know we, we do find big footprint footprints down there yeah yeah so so that's cool we've actually uh down the pine barrens are cool it's one of the best pieces of evidence is we go down there and every third year we go into this area and uh, down this river and we go about two miles hike off trail down this river and uh, we find footprints. And one year they were like really small, like five inch footprints. And then mm -hmm. three years later, they were a little bit bigger. They were like nine inch footprints. And then the next year they were like, or the third year, they were like 12 inch footprints. So they grew every uh, third year, which is really neat. And that's why I think that they maintain family groups and they stay in family groups. And I think that's, that's, um, again uh kind of confirms my theory of every third year yeah and that's and that, and that's i i really admire that you do that it's, it's like the longitudinal research where it's not just let's go camp in this place and oh, okay we didn't find anything let's just never go back mm, and no, i i feel like you see a lot that. of that you see a lot of that in the paranormal community and and even in the bigfoot community of just we're going to camp out at this place we'll spend two or three nights here we found nothing we're never going back and for me, like, I've always felt like I would love to just find a place and just consistently research there. Yeah. Because, yeah, like you're saying, if you're finding in the same area, if you're going there year after year after year and you're finding a little footprint and then next year it's a little bit bigger and then the year after that it's even bigger. Again, it's it's not proof of the, their existence, but it's one more piece that is a very subtle piece of evidence, but it's a good piece of evidence that you're saying, OK, we're finding 10 inch tracks this year and the next year they're 12 inches and the year after that they're 15 inches and it seems to be the same track and it seems to be growing this points to a population it points to a living creature a growing creature a biological creature and that's again not, not going to convince the skeptics but it's one more log on the fire that we can just say hey we got this one more piece of evidence we can throw on there and say this this is in interesting and it adds to this sort of uh you know just just body of evidence yeah absolutely so, so yeah. that's 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 very cool I, and i think the the more that we can add to that is is and the more that anybody and everybody uh in the field can add to that is the the the, the closer we're going to become to to finding out what this creature truly and really is yeah yeah do you guys work with any other groups do you, do you like collaborate or uh is it yeah. hard to find <clears throat> No, um, so I do everything. We, we have like a small uh, small group, about uh, 25, 30 people that uh, are my research group that I have go out with me, uh, mm -hmm. that I invite out to my expeditions and help me film and stuff like that. Um, uh, they're from all over the country. And generally speaking, we only go out with like four or five people if, at the most. Um, but uh, no, we, we do everything kind of solo. Uh, you know, we, we are open to, to meeting and talking to anybody and and you know, are, are very open with uh, analyzing anybody's evidence if they want to send it our way or, or anything like that. We're, we're more than happy to, to take a look at it. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'd love to go down with you to the Pine Barrens at some point. So next time you go, keep me yeah, in mind, open, man. <laughs> open, inv open invitation. Absolutely. Awesome, man. Thank you. Um, so before we wrap up, do you have any links? I, I know you mentioned your database earlier. Do you, have, do you have a link for that you want to share with everybody so they can check that out? Yeah, well, that's that's one of those long Google links. So uh, okay. you have to, um, if you go on the Facebook, so the link to that one is Facebook, and then you search for Sussex County Bigfoot NJ, and then okay. the link is right on top of that page. Okay. Uh, if you want to find us on, on our show's Facebook, it's In the Shadow of Big Red Eye. And then our YouTube is uh, the same as uh, In the Shadow of Big Red Eye or Sussex County Bigfoot is our channel. And uh, let's see, our uh, Instagram, you can go on Instagram, see some really behind the cool, that's how we actually connected. Exactly. Uh, some behind the, <laughs> behind the scenes cool stuff. I think Jason can attest to that. Oh, uh, definitely. Um, is Shadow of Red Eye. 
Awesome. And I'll, I'll put links below in the, you know, all the podcasts and the YouTube channel here so everybody can find them. Uh, but yeah, Mike, thank you so much, man. This was a great conversation. And I want to have you on again because I, I think we got to dig a little deeper on certain things. And hey, absolutely. Run out of time here. I want you to get on your hike, but uh, oh, definitely yeah, want to yeah, talk yeah. to you again. And, and yeah, let's go find the Jersey Devil and split that 10 grand. <laughs> okay, sounds great. <laughs> all right, man. Thanks so much for coming on. Take care. See you. Take care. Have a good night, man. Okay, everybody, thank you for watching. Uh, thanks, Mike Fomalant, for coming on the show in the shadow of Big Red Eye. Uh, really cool conversation. I learned a few things, and uh, Mike's got a really interesting point of view. I'm always open to different points of view, uh, even if I don't agree. And in this case, I changed my mind a little bit. Mike convinced me, so props to Mike for that. Uh, if you guys have any comments, leave them below. I'm going to leave all the links for Mike's uh, Facebook and his Instagram and his YouTube channel below. Check out his videos, really cool stuff. He's got really quick videos, you know, four, three, four, five minutes of just vocalizations. He's got hour long videos of expeditions that he's done, uh, you know, six years of this stuff. So check them out. Great stuff. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next week.